Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to talk about the sparse matrices and sparse matrix compression, and we will use the sparse matrix vector multiplication as an example algorithm. But let me very quickly recap on the other parallel patterns that we have covered already in this course. We started with the reduction operation, which is an operation that reduces a set of values to a single value. The reduction needs to have three main properties, associativity, commutativity, and identity value, and it's a key primitive for parallel computing. Remember that we discussed how to implement a divergence-free mapping on GPUs in order to maximize SIM utilization. The next parallel pattern was history and computation, that is an operation that is frequently used for reducing the dimensionality of data and extracting notable features. In history and calculation, what we typically do is reading input elements one by one and incrementing counters or beams in the histogram. The problem is that when we have multiple threads updating the histogram, we will need to use atomic operations. And for the correct result. And, and the atomic operations serialize the execution. So we need to figure out ways of uh, alleviating this serialization. And one way is called privatization that basically consists of placing multiple subhistograms in the shared memory. Each of them is going to be created by a different thread block. And when all subhistograms are done, they will be merged into a final histogram. In the next lecture, we covered convolution. When convolution, we apply a filter or a mask on each of the elements of the input and calculate the elements of the output used doing a weighted sum. Um, convolutions are extremely, uh, very much used in um, signal processing, image processing, video processing, computer vision. And these days, are they are very much using machine learning and artificial intelligence in convolution neural networks, for example. We discuss how to do a convolution, 1D convolution, applying a mask, in this case, a mask of uh, a size five on each of the elements of the input to compute partial products and then final reduction. We also discuss the, how to do a 2D convolution as well. And in the next lecture, we uh, uh, talk about implementing convolutional layers as matrix multiplication, an operation that basically requires us to unroll the um, input, the matrices of the input feature maps and the uh, convolution filters and place them in the form of a matrix and this way um, uh, compute as if it, it was a matrix multiplication, which is a very suitable operation for GPUs. We indeed discuss uh, um, uh, more advanced optimization techniques such as register tiling and shared memory tiling and how to combine them to uh, implement matrix multiplication in a very efficient manner. And in the previous lecture, we talk about prefix sum, an operation where we take an input and an associative operator and calculate the elements of the output by recursively applying the associative operator on the elements of the input array. Remember that there is ex exclusive scan and inclusive scan. And uh, we discussed how to implement a hierarchical inclusive scan that can be adapted to a system where we have two or more levels of parallelism. For example, in GPUs, where we have thread blocks, warps, and threads, uh, the first thing that we would do is partitioning the input over the thread blocks, and each of these thread blocks is going to do a per block scan. But then inside the thread blocks as well, we will use warps and we will use individual threads. Um, remember that in this hierarchical scan, there are different steps. Uh, and the one that you see on the slide is the scan, scan, add implementation, where we first, we first perform a per block scan, then we scan partial uh, sums, and finally, we perform the addition operation to add offsets to each of the corresponding elements of the per block scan. This is one uh, implementation. The other one that we discussed was the reduce scan scan, which saved some memory accesses and is especially more suitable for very large arrays. Today, we talk about the sparse matrices and sparse matrix computation. First of all, let's define what's a sparse matrix. We all know what's a dense matrix, which is a matrix where the majority of elements are not zero. And in a sparse matrix, the majority of elements are zero. It's a matrix where many elements are zero. And this is something that uh, will happen in many real world systems. But sparse matrices also uh, offer some opportunities. First of all, there is no need to allocate the space for zeros and that can save memory capacity. 
there is no need to load zeros from memory to the processor and that's going to save memory bandwidth and there is no need to compute with zeros and this will save computation time and that what happens for example in a sparse matrix vector multiplication it doesn't make sense to multiply by a zero because we already know that the result will be zero so these are opportunities but taking advantage of these opportunities entails some challenges because uh, storing in a compressed format will require more complex way of accessing the data than if we have everything in a dense matrix. So we are going to discuss a little bit about this today and you can um, learn more if you watch the extended version of this lecture. But let's start with a little bit of motivation. The sparse matrices are widespread today, and you can find them in recommender systems, for example, in graph analytics, different algorithms like PageRank or breadth research, and in neural networks, both in sparse DNNs or in graph neural networks. And the reality is that the real world matrices have high sparsity. If we take a look at connectivity graphs, from, for example, Facebook or um, YouTube, we will see that they are very sparse. So a good sparse matrix compression is essential to enable efficient storage and computation. Traditionally, there are uh, many uh, storage formats for sparse matrices and uh, most uh, well-known ones are co uh, coordinate format or COO that we are going to uh, briefly discuss today or the compressed sparse row or CSR that we are going to also introduce today. But there are other more sophisticated that can probably um, uh, result in better performance for some uh, kernels, for some algorithms on GPU, such as the LPAC format or ELL or the uh, JAK uh, diagonal storage or JDS. But there are many more, for example, based on bitmaps uh, that are also very efficient in storage, at least for certain matrices. When choosing one storage format, there are some design considerations to take into account. First of all is um, space efficiency, how, mem how much memory they consume. Second one is the flexibility, meaning the ease of adding or reordering elements. Uh, then there is also the accessibility or the ease of finding the desired data. We are going to see a couple of examples of these. And there is the memory access pattern as well, whether in a parallel system like a GPU, they enable coalesced memory accesses. And finally, load balance, uh, how much they can minimize control divergence, because the fact that matrices are sparse will make that they don't have the same number of elements, for example, in each row, and that that might be a source of divergence if we have different threads working in different roles, as uh, we are going to see soon. So um, we are going to use SPMB as an example. The choice of the best storage format depends on the computation and the matrix characteristics, the sparsity, basically. And as I said, we are going to use a sparse matrix vector multiplication as an example to study different formats. In matrix vector multiplication, we have a sparse matrix. Uh, that you can see on the left hand side of the figure and we have a dense vector and the result will be an output dense vector as well. So let's start with the coordinate format or CO. Observe that here we have the original matrix and here we are storing the, uh, uh, the matrix in the um, sparse uh, compression format. And notice that for every element of the sparse matrix, we store the non-zero element along with its row index and its column index. For example, this element here of value one has indices zero and zero. So this is what we store in the um, sparse matrix format. When it comes to performing a matrix vector, a sparse matrix vector multiplication using COO, one typical parallelization approach is to assign one thread per non-zero element, uh, same as we are doing here in the image, and then uh, each uh, thread will have to go to the corresponding element of the input vector, perform the multiplication, and then accumulate. And the problem is that we have multiple threads writing to the same output, to the same element of the output vector, and that it's going us to uh, it's going to require us to use atomic operations. For an example code, you can see it in this slide. Um, in this SPMV COO kernel, 
First of all, is to um, define what's the index of the element that each thread is going to work on. And um, using this index, we first uh, access the row and the column indices in the, uh, in the matrix, in the um, sparse uh, compressed matrix, as we see for row and column. And then we read the value of that specific element. Using that value, and using the corresponding element given by the uh, column index in the um, input vector, we perform this partial multiplication and then we need to accumulate. As I said earlier, because we have multiple threads or we may have multiple threads working on the same row and uh, updating the same element of the output vector, we need to use uh, atomic additions to avoid red data races. COO has certain trade-offs. It has advantages and disadvantages. In terms of advantages, it's flexible because it's easy to add new elements to the matrix. Uh, Non-zeros can be stored in any order because each non-zero is accompanied with its row index and its column index. So it's very easy to add a new one. You just put it at the end. Um, in terms of accessibility, given a non-zero, it's easy to find the row and the column. Um, and it has uh, coalesced memory accesses. When we are using SPMB, because consecutive threads are accessing consecutive elements of the matrix, and this guarantees uh, coalesced memory accesses. And at the same time, there is no control divergence, and that's something that you can check in the previous code. However, it has its advantages. First of all, if uh, we are given a row or a column and we are asked to find all non-zero elements of the row or of the column, that won't be easy. We'll have to scan through the entire, um, entire uh, uh, sparse matrix, unless they are sorted, of, of course, or we do uh, pre-sorting before uh, searching. And also the uh, second disadvantage is, is that the uh, SPMV uh, version using CO requires the use of atomic operations as we have seen. We are going to briefly discuss another important uh, sparse matrix format, which is probably even more widely uh, widely used, that is a compressed sparse row. In this case, as uh, CSR has one key advantage that is usually provides a high compression ratio, and it's used uh, very much in many libraries and frameworks for CPUs and for GPUs. So in compressed sparse row or CSR, the key is to have an array of row pointers. So we are going to start the non-zeros of the same row adjacently, and we will have an index or a pointer to the first element of each row. So instead of now storing for each value, the row and the column, we are still storing the column index, but uh, because we uh, are, uh, implementing this CSR format based on the assumption that all values in the same row are going to be adjacent, we can use this array of row pointers that indicates what's the index of the column and value array where the corresponding elements of each row start. Um, now, when it comes to implementing a parallelization approach for SPMB, the normal thing here is to assign different threads to different rows. So this way, each thread is going to be in charge of computing the partial product and the um, um, accumulation of the each uh, the elements of one row and the input vector. So, for example, if the vectors uh, the, the threads start here, um, in every iteration they will go to the matrix, read one element of the matrix, then go to the vector, read the corresponding element of the vector, perform the partial multiplication and accumulate. And in the next iteration, they will go to the next element and so on and so forth. Observe that one thing that we can see here already is that there is some, it's likely that there will be thread divergence. There will be intra-warp divergence. Why is that? Because different threads are working on different rows and different rows may have different number of non-zero elements. 
Um, and that's going to be one of the disadvantages of um, the CSR format. And here you can see the code. Uh, first of all, we um, find what's the role to work on um, given by the block index and block dimensions and thread index. Basically, each thread works on one row. And then we go over all the elements of that row, read the uh, column index, then read the uh, value and uh, perform the multiplication of the corresponding elements element of the vector given the column index and the value of the adjacency matrix. And after that, we accumulate this, this sum variable that is at the very end written to the output vector. CSR has also some trade-offs uh, versus uh, COO and has advantages and disadvantages. For example, in terms of advantages is Space is uh, space efficient because row pointer are smaller than row indices. Notice, notice that now we don't need to keep the row index for every single thread. We just keep one pointer to the beginning of each row in the adjacency matrix. Uh, in terms of accessibility, given a row is easy to find all non zeros. If we are given one row, all non zeros will be um, uh, right after um, each other in the in the for, for in the same row adjacently. Um, in terms of uh, advantages as well, the implementation of uh, SVMB, as we have just seen, avoids atomic operations because every thread owns its own output and is assigned one element of the output. And then in terms of disadvantages, um, um, in terms of flexibility, is not that good because it's hard to add new elements to the matrix. We would need to uh, rearrange or reorganize the data in the different rows. In terms of accessibility, giving a non-zero is hard to find a row, and giving a column is hard to find all non-zeros. We'll have to go over uh, all row sections, finding which elements are in the specific column that we are looking for. And um, as we have seen as well, um, SPMB uh, implementation, the memory accesses are not coalesced. And the, re the reason for that is that we have one row after the other in the compressed uh, format, and we are assigning different rows to different threads. So one thread is accessing here, another thread is accessing here. It's, that's at a certain distance, so not uh, coalesced accesses. And finally, it has control divergence, as we mentioned earlier as well, because the number of non zero elements in, in each row is different. So the number of iterations that every thread will have to do will be different as well. SPMV is uh, typically regular. It's typically a, um, it's a challenging algorithm for uh, efficient implementations on parallel machines, but it has the additional disadvantage that is a memory-bound computation. And memory-bound means that it requires many accesses. It's very memory intensive in the accesses. Observe that as we have just seen in the implementations of SPMV, we need to access not only the non-zero value, but we also in the CSR, for example, we have to use the, um, uh, the array of uh, row pointers and we have to access as well the array of column indices. So there are many uh, memory accesses and not so much computation because it's just one multiplication and one addition per element. So, um, so yeah, in that sense, it's a memory bound uh, uh, operation. And if we analyze it, for example, using the roof line model, we will see that SPMB falls in the memory bound area of the roof line. So because that's the case, it's being considered as an important primitive and uh, suitable primitive for processing in memory systems. In processing in memory systems, we typically have a memory called PIM enabled memory where DRAM banks or memory arrays are, um, are uh, together with some sort of compute units or processing elements or PIM cores that uh, allow us to compute near the memory. And that, and this way, this uh, cores enjoy low level, low memory access latency and large uh, memory bandwidth. And these uh, PIN systems are becoming a reality with the advent of um, AppMem, but also prototypes from Samsung or SK Hynix among others. In um, our research, we have done an extensive analysis of SVMB, and we have created an SVMB library for real processing in memory systems. This library is composed of 25 SVMB kernels for different compressed formats, data types, data partitioning techniques, 
load balancing techniques and synchronization approaches. And we provide as well a comprehensive analysis of the SPMB implementations on the first real world processing in memory system from AppMem using up to 26 sparse matrices. As you will see in this work, we explore different partitioning techniques, for example, 1D partitioning or 2D partitioning. In 1D partitioning, we can perform the complete computation and the individual pin cores. In 2D partitioning, we will need to merge results on the CPU, but at the same time, we are saving data movement between the main memory and the pin enabled memory. So there are uh, interesting trade-offs here. Um, this is the, here you can find the link to the repository that contains the library with all the different 1D, 2D versions uh, using uh, different sparse matrices, um, using different load balance and synchronization approaches and different data types. This week as well in our other course, the PIM course, we deliver a short lecture, a short introduction uh, to this sparse P library. And here you can find the link if you are interested in uh, learning more about SPMB and about what are their um, key limitations and how they can be overcome with uh, processing in memory systems. And if you are in general more interested in learning more about the sparse matrix computation, I refer you to chapter 14 of Programming Massively Parallel Processors and for sure the longer version of this lecture where we discuss more compression formats, also some uh, new ones using bitmaps, for example, that are uh, very efficient and also allow faster computation of SPMB or SPMM and other sparse matrix operations. This is all for today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Let me know if you want to discuss anything about this lecture or the course, and I hope to see you in the next one.